What's up, everyone? This is Alex. Quick note about this episode before we hop into it. My co-host Jesse and I recorded an emergency episode about the Silicon Valley Bank situation on Friday, March 10th. When we recorded the episode, SVB had collapsed, its stock plummeted, there was a run on the bank by its depositors, and the FDIC had taken over. There wasn't yet clarity on what would happen to customers' deposits above the $250,000 limit that was insured by the FDIC, and there wasn't yet a buyer of SVB. Since recording the episode, other important pieces of the puzzle have occurred. First, the Biden administration announced that all customers of SVB will have full access to their deposits as of Monday, March 13th. Second, Signature Bank, a New York-based bank with $110 billion in assets and $89 billion in deposits, was closed. The FDIC was appointed receiver of the bank, and all depositors were protected in the same way as Silicon Valley Bank. Now, while the facts around the story have changed, I still think you will find this episode of The Crazy Ones to be really instructive. Jesse is an expert in how banks work and how this situation unfolded, so you will gain a deep understanding of the banking system, what causes runs on banks, and what caused the 16th largest bank in the country to collapse. Now, on to the episode. What's up, everyone? I'm Alex Lieberman. Yo, this is Jesse Pucci. And this is The Crazy Ones. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of The Crazy Ones. This is not normal programming. Um, I want to say it was midday yesterday. So we're recording on Friday, March 10th. Uh, and it was midday yesterday when I just saw, started seeing all of my like founder and post exit founder groups blowing up. The only thing that was being talked about was Silicon Valley Bank. Were you seeing the same thing, Jesse? Yeah. Yeah. It's been a crazy. 24, 36 hours. Yes. So, you know, this is one of those stories where, you know, we'd be remiss not to talk about what's happening with Silicon Valley Bank, how banks even work, like how did things get to this point, what a run on a bank means, and how founders should be thinking about navigating not just this situation, but situations like this moving forward. So with that, we're going to have a short discussion about the whole Silicon Valley Bank uh, situation. And if you have any questions for us, shoot us an email at thecrazyones at morningbrew.com. So let's do this thing. Yeah. I'll start. Let me start by saying actually one thing, which is, <clears throat> you know, I never want to see a business fail. Um, Silicon Valley Bank was a partner of mine for over 10 years. And like the people there are awesome and they supported Ampush during tough times. Um, and I think a lot of companies and a lot of businesses, it's like really sad because it's it's a it's a wonderful organization. And they've been around for a while, right? 40 years. Yeah. So I think I think I was just like, I'd say I'm, I'm feeling for all my all the people who worked with me and supported me there. Um, you know, Greg Becker on the way down to the, C, the CEO all the way on, down. And I have some former employees who work there. Uh, and, and I think like, you know, I, I assume right now um, we'll talk about our, our relative exposures to this, but. There are people who have who are going to be in real big trouble because of this, uh, founders, and and I'm just like feeling for all you guys right now, and like pulling for you to grind through it because it's going to be it's going to be a rough time. Yeah, I definitely think it's uh, it's a good thing to to point out because it's it's very easy for people to talk about this situation, but for the people who are actually experiencing it, it's it's horrible. And it's also you know I feel like you and I spend a lot of time on Twitter and. Normally, I'm I'm fully about kind of like the Twitter meme culture and like people just like making jokes about, you know, Silicon Valley and startups in general. But I think this is one of those topics where, you know, joking doesn't, pro- you know, it's like a time and place for everything. And this isn't the time. So, yeah. And I mean, there's I, real times with us, like where if, if Silicon Valley Bank had thrown the book at us, we Ampush would have never made it, would be out of business. And they totally. gave us grace and they were like helpful to us. And so, fuck, I mean, it's just like a... It sucks. Uh, it's it sucks wild. This is what happened. So, so I want to I want to step back because, like you know, obviously I've read up on the story, but I feel like you know you're intimately familiar with everything that's gone on. And so, I guess, but before we talk about like what got Silicon Valley Bank in this position that caused the run on the bank, that has people wondering, are they going to be be able to make payroll for their businesses? Can you just kind of break down like how is it that any bank, not just Silicon Valley Bank, right. works, 
And how does a bank in general get into the spot that they got in? Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. Um, banks are incredibly unique and complex businesses, and they're actually really important for any kind of capitalistic society to operate because they, you know, I like to think of it as they grease the gears of capitalism because if, if without them, money wouldn't be able to sit somewhere and then it wouldn't be able to get, get put out somewhere. But they're actually pretty confusing businesses to understand and how they make money and, and what they do. So let's talk about a bank. So <clears throat> we go make a deposit, whether you're an individual or a business, you put a thousand dollars into a bank account. That's your asset, right? We literally in in common culture say at money in the bank, that's my asset. It's actually the bank's liability. So one of the weird things about a bank is it, it's its balance sheet is flip flop from a normal business's balance sheet or a normal person's balance sheet, right? So that's a liability, which means that's money they owe you. They have to pay you out at some point. Well, yeah, they can charge you fees and ATM stuff. That doesn't make them the, the real money. What then they do with that money is they have to hold back a certain portion of it for reserves, which they, by the way, they didn't have to a hundred years ago. And then the great depression happened, Yep. but they have to hold back say 20% of it. And then they, they go and they lend that money out to someone for some reason. The classic example is sort of like they go give it to a person, you know, who wants to get a mortgage to buy a, yep. a nice a house. And so say they go and offer you, you know, what I'm making numbers up 1% for your deposit for a checking account, by the way, they offer zero. Uh, and they have a higher reserve requirement for a savings account. They may offer a little bit. So, and then they, they lend it out at 5%. So on my thousand dollar example in a year, the revenue of the bank would be thousand dollars. 5% of that is 50 bucks. Their cost would be 10 bucks plus whatever overhead and admin. And like they make this thing called like a, a net interest margin. So that's the yep. way that they actually make money is they borrow from depositors and they lend to various things and various people's now silicon valley bank it's a very interesting you know most of their cash was coming from startups or vcs right that's i mean literally the name of their bank and so they would get all their cash from those people and then they would lend out to you know they they, they lent to ampush when we, we did an acquisition they helped finance it so they gave us five million dollars we paid them i forget the rate five plus whatever and and they're again they're making that spread that's how banks make money now the reserve obviously holds back. There's one other thing that's important to realize, which is in an ecosystem of banks, if you then put money, uh, you lend me money to buy my house with, right? Uh, or you lend me money to buy a company with, the person who gets that money then takes that money and then they put it in their bank account. Well, then that bank yep. does the same thing. So there's this really unique money multiplier thing that starts to happen where there's a lot more sort of like deposits on deposit technically that then exist cash in the world at any given time. And that's like when people talk about a bank being levered, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the amount of cash and deposits they have versus what's going on. Now, Silicon Valley Bank took money from VCs, you know, usually that was funding their startups, just held that bank. They're actually a very conservative bank traditionally. And then they went out and lent it out to startups and did other business. Now, they had to go and you know, it, it's kind of a funny, not funny, but it, it's an unfortunate sequence of events with PPP because we actually got our PPP money from Silicon Valley Bank, Ampush did. And so the government goes and says, hey, I'm going to go put trillions of dollars into the economy. And Silicon Valley Bank's deposits went from something like $60 billion to like $200 billion yeah, in was, less than two years. Yeah, $190 billion from 2019 to 2022. That's how much it went up by. Yeah, it went from saying? 60 to 190. 190, yeah. So 3X, okay? Yeah. So, hey, that's cool for them as a bank. But now think about what you're in the business of. I have all this cash and I got to go lend it out. Well, there weren't that many startups borrowing money and there weren't like, you know, and so in your in their position, what would you do? And you probably did it in that time frame, the 2021, 2022 time frame. You said, let me just buy some safe, theoretically safe, long dated mortgages, long dated government backed bonds, you know, those are good deals. I'll hold them till they mature. I got to put my assets somewhere because I have all these assets that I didn't have before all these deposits that came in. Yeah. They're just like, I want safe yield. Like they're like, I, want I just safe, want safe yield so yield. I can make my margin. I don't margin. have to think about it. I got all this kind of free money from PPP. And it's, it's like, also there's a whole another funny conversation around the government gave all these people money and then they turn around and lent money back to the government, yep. which we will save for another day. But they did that. But back then the interest rates were one, two percent. Right. And now, as we all know, interest rates are four or five percent. 
So now all of a sudden they had this issue where they were lending money. They had lent money out at one or 2%. And all of a sudden the cost of money has gone above that. It's gone to like 4%, right? And so in finance, like if the interest rate goes up, the value goes down. You probably remember that from your trading, yep. your nine months of trading, right? Exactly. And and so technically what happens is all of those, those things that they bought were worth far less. Yep. They just went down in value. Now they could have just held them to maturity, but the other issue that starts to occur when you have that much in long dated stuff is you, you're kind of, you're in a rock and a hard place. Think of it as like owning your home for 30 years. You have two choices. You can either sell your home and get the money today, but you're going to sell your house at a loss. That's the same thing as owning the mortgage. You're going to either own that mortgage and sell it at a loss, or you can hold on to it, but you don't have any money. You're, you just own the physical house, right? So, totally. so what do you do if you need cash? If you need, and banks need cash because they have to facilitate. And, and by the way, to that point, like, you know, we don't have to go to, into this whole thing of like duration risk, but like basically there's this huge risk of the Fed, at, you know, there's a plan for the Fed to keep raising rates. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 like the book value of these mortgages is only expected to get lower Worse. and lower, right? Yeah. So the question is, how, how much of that risk are they willing to take take on? Yeah, exactly. And, and so, you know, and then the other thing that was happening just to give it voice is like, less VCs being invested. And people may not realize this, but for those listening, venture capitalists don't sit on, if when they say I raised a billion dollar fund, they're not sitting on a billion dollars. That money stays yeah. with whoever said they're going to, and then they do capital calls. So that money sits wherever it belongs. Then the VC takes it. Then it actually does sit inside the companies, but it's like less of those checks were being written. So there's less deposits coming in, which they're dependent upon. And these guys are all burning cash. So <laughs> their cash deposits are going down just because every month they have all have less money in the bank. That's a, a company that's burning. So, you know, you started to create this very, very challenging situation where uh, I was talking with one of my former bosses from Goldman this morning and he, I texted him this morning. I said, what's going to happen? And he said, it's going to be zero by the end of the day. Like he knew it. And he said he'd actually shorted it in December. And, and he knew that because of this big duration thing we just talked about where their assets sat. And because he said their their clients, like where they get their money and their deposits from, or just they, they, they had all done the venture math and realized, oh, they're just not going to get enough cash to support what's going on. Now, all of that is a good reason to short a bank um, and make money off the equity being worth less. None of that is a good reason for Silicon Valley Bank to now be uh, in receivership. Yep. So let's talk about how did that end up happening? You, why don't, yeah. you, I don't know and, if you paid attention to it, but you can take on because I've been talking a while. Well, yeah, yeah. So like basically, just just to sum up what you said, basically Silicon, Silicon Valley Bank, their deposits grew threefold over the course of three years. There was only so much that they could do with their increase in deposits. They, there weren't that many, there weren't three X the number of startups that they could lend money to. So they had to invest in something to get their yield so that they were making more yield than the, uh, basically the, the, uh, yield that they were giving to their depositors. Those were mortgage backed securities. The rates of mortgage backed securities moved up a ton, which basically means the value of $80 billion worth of mortgages went down significantly. They sold those mortgages or 20 something billion of them at a, I believe a $2 billion loss. Yep. And, but, but my understanding here and correct me if I'm wrong is that actually isn't what created this whole issue. None of it. Yeah. I mean, they, they actually went out and they said, you know, we're selling this at $2 billion loss. And frankly, they did it. They're, they're great. They're great bankers. They, they said, by the way, guess what? We've already got 2 billion of capital coming in to cover that shortfall. So in an already, it's highly conservative what they did. They could have just said, guys, we were selling this at a small loss. Who cares? It's, you know, we totally. have hundreds of billions of assets. What's the big deal? But they even went out and that's, and then, and then there was a series of, of miss, you know, missteps or. Yeah. Or so walk through basically what they did, luck. because I think this is so important, by the way, because I think people who haven't necessarily gone down the rabbit hole of Silicon Valley Bank assume like, you know, like this is like Lehman 2.0, yeah. like they were financial bad actors, but all of this Nothing actually like that at all. Is, yeah. is literally just a function of mo basically momentum created by founders and VCs having fear that they wouldn't be able to get their money. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's, I think that's part of it. So, so they go out. So, so what ends up happening is there's this other bank that was a really crappy bank yep. called Silvergate or yeah, Silvergate. Yep. And I don't even know anything about them. I've never heard of them, but 
at the same day that the that that Silicon Valley Bank announced, hey, we're going to do this repositioning. Um, and by the way, we've got some more cap- capital coming in. General Atlantic invest. General Atlantic is like an f- amazing, great investor, highly blue chip. It, it, I think a lot of these people who had, had been sort of worried basically said, oh, like Silvergate went on. It literally happened the same day. It happened to have happened the same day. And which was kind of a PR mistake, right? They should have waited. They could have announced it next week or they could have done, you know, they, they could have managed the news more carefully. They could have taken the capital first and then done this, whatever. There's probably five different ways they could have managed it. Um, but they didn't. And, and in our financial system, in our stock market, in our banking system, it trust is paramount. And when you start to lose trust, you know, all hell breaks loose. So basically they did that. It panicked a bunch of people that hit the stock pretty hard. The stock going down led to, I like you got in a lot of group texts. I got a lot of group texts. My, you know, we're saying, you know, if you have money there, take it out. Yep. Uh, you know, and, and we, in a personal thing, it was just a kind of a crazy situation for me. We had some, some money from leftover from the ambush deal in an old bank account. Like that was still, some of it had to stay in there for escrow. Some of it was just, we hadn't taken care of. Like Is we that personal money or business money? It was tech, it was business money that hadn't been distributed. And so like, you know, my co-founder Nick yesterday goes, Hey guys, I just, you know, being prudent, we should take everything but the escrow out. Cause we couldn't take the escrow out. That's legally required. So we yeah. did that. And then both of us called each other like, man, I feel kind of bad. You know, they, they were good, but everyone's doing that, right? It's sort of a game of hot potato. And then again, if you think about how their balance sheet works, deposits are liabilities. There are things that have to be, now they're, they're hyper short-term liabilities, which means anytime someone asks for them, they have to come off their, their balance sheet. And I was looking earlier today, Silicon Valley Bank, you know, we said 200 billion in assets, whatever. Do you, guess how much cash they have on their balance sheet as of December 31st? 10 billion. Yeah, roughly 13 billion, 13 or 14 yeah. billion. They probably have ballpark 10, 20,000 customers. 10, 20,000 customers all pull out, say 10,000 customers pull out 5 million. That's 50 billion. Is that math right? Yeah. All of a sudden they don't have cash. I mean, they don't have the cash to cover that, right? They, they just, there's no way, and they can't sell those things because they're long dated or they'll have to sell more at a bigger loss. And it just leads to this, untenable situation the sad part is it's driven by their customers and by fear and by like and again you and i are sort of in the ecosystem so by the numbers numbers of texts and calls and emails going if you have money there you should probably there, pull it there out. was one group chat i'm in there's a post exit founder group chat i'm in just in that group there was like a, a tally taken of how much money was taken out by just those founders and it was two billion dollars of deposits and there you go yeah so that's too i mean now you're saying that in your little group or big group. I don't know how many people are in it, but it's probably not more 300 than 100 people. people. Huh? 300 people. Okay. So in a group of 300 people, you're telling me that basically their uh, 20% of their balance sheet was gone just yeah. in that group. And so I think the other thing, you know, they, Greg Becker went on and there's like a famous thing in banking where like you never tell people not to panic or not even banking and just in life. <laughs> you know, if you, if you, if a play, if, a, if the uh, captain gets on the air thing and says, Hey guys, you know, one of our engines is gone, but please don't panic. Everybody starts panicking, right? Totally. And it, that's what happened yesterday. And, and it happened in big and small ways. And and it, like he kind of, he said those words, don't panic. And then everybody started panicking. And so I think, you know, the stock then keeps dropping. And basically, you know, clearly by the end of the day, I think they tried to raise capital. Nobody wanted to put money in it. Then they tried to sell the business. Nobody could buy it. Because by the way, imagine that that balance sheet every minute is dropping by a billion dollars or whatever, right? Every hour, a billion oh, yeah. dollars is going out. Who could evaluate it? Yeah, and so you I think can. they did the I only mean, thing they the, could. The which... market's just changing too fast. And and so I guess the question is, is, is my understanding is, first of all, that of their, let's call it a hundred and eighty billion of deposits, something like a hundred and seventy six billion were uninsured because all you know the right. only thing that's insured is the two hundred fifty k. Because it's uh, a business that, bank, right? Like if it's a personal yeah. bank, nobody keeps more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars uh, in their personal accounts. But in a business account, you keep millions of dollars. <laughs> so, so let's just use like you as the example. But I th- think this can be extrapolated to other founders. That that million dollars from Ampush that's kept in escrow. What happens now? Yeah. So uh, you know, we we left a million bucks uh, there. We tried to wire it today uh, after that announcement, and it's not getting wired. Obviously, um, what what you know, I don't know is a short answer. No clue. I think the smart people I've spoken with said, "Well, look, two hundred fifty thousand you'll get, and you'll probably get it next week. 
because it's insured by the government, which is nice. And then the other 750, like you're in line, you're, you're now you should be a senior creditor to whatever this, you know, receiver, when someone says receivership, that means bankruptcy. It basically means you've been put into bankruptcy so that somebody else can over watch the like liquidation of something. I think there, I've heard lots of rumors unsubstantiated, of course, that like they will get bought over the weekend, like JP Morgan or somebody's going to come in and buy them because now that the government stabilized it, um, someone, but can how finally... do you value that business? Going back to your point, like how do you value this thing that doesn't have deposits anymore? I don't think, I, I think they get, get, they, you know, people get to keep their jobs and, and maybe some comp packages or whatever. Like nobody makes any, like the shareholders yeah. are zero or near zero. Yeah. Um, or like you just buy it for zero and then some shareholders will sue and they'll get settled. But like, I mean, that's like, you know, Bear Stearns was bought out for $2. Merrill Lynch, I think was given, right? Bank of America was like, yeah, you better just give this to me. because I'm not going to, I'm not going to take it otherwise. So, and that's like the crazy thing that it's kind of a funny, you know, financial institutions don't, they don't really make anything, you know? And so, and so they rely on trust and, and relationships and credibility and all these different things. And it is pretty sad when you zoom out, it's just kind of like how everyone turned on them. And even like as someone who kind of semi did that, right? Like we took out what we could. It's the challenging thing is it has nothing to do with them from my perspective. It's like, again, everyone else, it's just like one of these classic panicky situations where you're like, well, I don't want to be the person left holding the bag. Like, I don't want to be the the boy scout here that gets screwed over by other, other people panicking. And so it just ended up being the situation. And it's just sad that it, that it came to that. But, but yeah, I, th- I think we'll get in line. I think there'll be a creditor process. You know, my guess, like people have told me, you know, La- Lehman's last claim was paid 14 years after it was, if, after the bankruptcy, people have told me three to six years, like we're not going to see that money for three to six years. It's wild. Uh, I want to I want to talk for a minute about um what if any contagion could look like. But first, quick message from uh, the folks that pay the bills. This episode of the Crazy Ones is brought to you by Electric. One thing all business leaders know for sure: security is paramount. To grow with confidence and create your best work, you need to trust your work will stay protected and supported. And Electric is your go-to for IT needs, big, small, and somewhere in between. Access proactive security standardization across devices, apps, and networks, and rest easy knowing you have lightning fast IT support at your service. But that's not all. If you complete a qualified meeting with Electric, they will send you a free pair of AirPods Pro. To qualify, you must be an IT decision maker at a US based company with 10 to 500 employees. Get started at electric.ai slash crazy ones. That's electric.ai slash crazy ones. Let's be real. Business owners can't do everything. There are just too many fires to put out on the daily from managing benefits coverage for employees to navigating intricate payrolls to dealing with compliance penalties. But to level up your biz, you're going to need the confidence to handle all of these challenges. Here's a pro tip. Don't do it alone. ADP's PEO, ADP Total Source, is here to help. As a leading PEO, ADP has seen it all, from helping businesses handle tricky employee situations to managing turnover and compensation. And with up to 53% of small businesses getting sued by their employees every year, ADP Total Source stands with you. They back you with their EPLI policy, and they're the only PEO that stands behind their advice with a legal defense benefit. Terms and conditions apply, but this is a big deal. And the cherry on top? Research has shown that businesses that partner with a PEO grow 7 to 9% faster. It's a no-brainer. Partner up with ADP Total Source. Want to see if your business is a good fit for a PEO? Go to adp.com slash thecrazyones to find out. That's adp.com slash thecrazyones. Just using the example of Lehman not paying out kind of their last creditors for 14 years, like what happens to these startups that were using the deposit that they had with Silicon Valley Bank to pay for their operations? They have payroll in the next week or two weeks, unless a deal's done by then and everyone's paid out, which I would assume the the odds of that are zero. Like what happens? Um, I mean, I hope people figure out a way. I mean, I, I'll give you again a personal anecdote as soon as this is happening, you know, a lot of people are paying me most of all the Gateway X stuff and growth. This isn't all that stuff is with JP Morgan Chase. Yep. Because that's I, where I, our I money's bank, with also. I bank there personally. Um, and so I'm like, all right, we're cool. We're cool. Right. And and then I'm like, wait a second. I've been, I've seen this before. I was young, but I remember this. I'm like, there's got to be other angles. I start thinking of the other angles. Well, 
one of our uh, Unbloat's biggest lender is is Settle. And Settle lends us money against media and inventory to buy, you know, to and buy And you're like, stuff. where do they get their money from? They, they bank with Silicon Valley Bank. So I immediately got, are you guys okay? Because if, if we lose a credit line for Unbloat, Unbloat's gone. Like, it, it, you know, or I have to you know, put a lot more capital into it, which I, I probably wouldn't do, right? And so that one was, seems good for now, but we have some backup options. Then I'm like, wait a second, who, who's our payroll? Who does payroll? And so I go, oh, shoot, Rippling does payroll. So, oh, yep, Rippling has exposure to Silicon Valley. I saw Bank. their CEO with that thread. And guess what? I, I sent, we sent payroll money out this morning and we have no idea where it is right now. Like, and, and so I, I went, went on to the Slack with my Kahani folks and I was like, hey guys, I'm on top of this. Don't worry. We bank with JP Morgan. We're all good. No, we have no direct exposure. Then literally an hour later, I'm like, Take that back, guys. You may be getting paid late next week because I don't know where this money... Like, I, I'll figure it out, but, like, I want you to know that right now the money is between us, them, like, two banks and one bank that may not be around. And so, you know, the stuff... It would, Not only is it going to be highly disruptive for operations, focus all this other stuff, but, um, but yeah, I mean, to your point around founders who, if you're burning... Yeah, you know, making something up. Say you're burning $10 million in cash, you have, or, or you're burning a million in cash, you have $20 million in the bank, and now most of it's gone. Even if it's an asset, this, they, literally the startups will have the same problem that the bank had, which is I have totally. assets. I'll probably get them back one day, but I don't have liquidity. There's a mismatch. To, yeah, I, liquidity. I don't. I just don't have the money to, to meet my obligations. And so, and then anyone who's near the brink, or like, I mean, it, there's going to be, unfortunately, I think a lot of fallout from this. Um, and I just hope, and and like, I would tell anyone listening, or what, like, I just hope people don't let it spread to other banks. You know, because the, I don't even want to say this, but the reality is if other, if everyone starts to pull any bank, this could happen to any bank because if somebody wakes up and everyone starts pulling their money out at one time, any bank at any moment could fail. Right. Yeah. I mean, I saw even like first Republic today was down on the news despite it having no seeming well, the whole sector to, yesterday and today have been crushed by it. But, well, yeah. partly because they do all have the same duration issue, just not as pronounced. And then they all have more diversified customers. Right? right. They don't have these. these yeah. I mean, that. I think that's a big thing to point out here also that we just haven't. It's obvious. It's obvious, but we haven't mentioned it is like, you know, an inherent embedded risk to Silicon Valley Bank is, you know, that they've it's implied in the name. Like they've always been considered the bank of founders, startups and VCs. And so like there's actually a ton of inherent trust risk baked into that because it doesn't take long for that customer base to ha to be thinking the same exact thing. Whereas like a bank like JP Morgan, obviously we have way, way more history in terms of trust being built, but also right. a far more diversified customer base for trust or like fear of trust to be spreading. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a, you know, I, th I think it's going to be rough for, um, I think a lot of the like FinTech or lending businesses are going to have some challenges related to this because like just liquidity is going to become a, a more challenged situation. Um, and, you know, I, I posted this tweet from a buddy of mine who's, who's a really sophisticated hedge fund guy. And I'd summarize it by, he said, look, the last 10 years, everybody, the whole business ecosystem is built off of free money, basically between, you know, some people say zero interest rates, but it, he told me one time, it's actually way negative interest rates. The government's been paying you to take its money because of all the PPP and the free money yep. that's been handed out. So it's been better than free money. We've gotten, we've been paid to take money. And he goes, and now that's not the case anymore. And we're only six to nine months into this. Like some wonky, weird stuff is going to happen because there's a just a massive readjusting that has to take place in the world to kind of adjust to this new reality. So I think this is unfortunately one of them. And it's, you know, again, it's sad and it sucks because it's, uh, it's such a great firm and and they've they've helped so many companies, right? Um, and always been great partners. So uh, I have I have uh, a few more questions before we finish things up. The the first is. From a founder's perspective, obviously hindsight's twenty twenty, but is there a way that founders could have avoided this sort of exposure that makes sense within the context of running their business? Like for example, I I saw a thread that um, Andrew Wilkinson brought back up from a while ago, where he basically was like, he thinks it's idiotic for founders to keep their money in cash within a bank because you know you're relying on the bank. It should just always be in you know short dated treasuries because you're getting yield and you have a government guarantee i think that that makes a lot of sense the the other side to it though is like you can't operate your business you can't run your operations 
on short dated treasuries, you need cash to operate your business. Right. So like, how should founders think about like financial risk like that? Is there anything that someone could have done? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to be a boon for all these startups who are doing treasury services because now all of a sudden, hundred percent. You know, and what, what, by the way, one quick aside before I answer the question is, I think Warren Buffett has this famous quote where he says like, cash is like oxygen, like you don't notice it until it's no longer there. And then and that's the only thing you care about. And I think we literally just experienced that an entire ecosystem just experienced that, which is like, no one was worrying about breathing until someone said, you know, the air might leave this room. And then we were all like, oh, we got to gas for as much air as we possibly can get because it yeah. might be gone. And, and, uh, that's what happens. But I mean, look, I, I think these startups are going to do well as, as they're well, this is going to be a positive moment for them, which is, uh, we, I've been doing this with JP Morgan. I mean, I have everything in CDs and treasuries. And then it's really annoying, by the way. Every two weeks, I have to sign a thing. And blah, 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 so the money has to come out for payroll. And it, like, and at first, I was like getting annoyed by it. And then and someone was like, this is just a new reality because A, you're getting yield. I, by the way, we were doing it for yield purposes. We were getting a, a rate on the money, right? Right, so, versus like protection purposes. But now I think it's going to be even more with protection purposes to be in treasuries or money markets or things that just have more protection. And then, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think... Uh, you know, like anything, it's funny. You just don't think about it, but like you should have diverse banking partners. Yep. You know, have more, like even we, we were we were in the middle like of trying to figure out how to do this with the private equity guys and the and the continuity the people who bought us, and we had to be like, hey, can we waive this requirement for the escrow and move this money out, right? And they're like, yeah, you know, they obviously understood the situation. They're like, well, what bank account are you going to move it to? And we were like, we don't have another business. We, like the, the you know, our S Corp doesn't have another business bank account. It just doesn't. And so we were like, we'll move it to Nick's account. Like, so even that's just like silly, right? Like have multiple bank accounts, um, have them connected with each other so that you can move money freely between them. Um, Which again, I, uh, j- just like, I totally agree with you, but it is so much like one of those hindsight is 2020 it's so things. Annoying. It's like, yeah, it's so annoying. Be- because it's like, of course, that's not a risk that you actually thought you would have to worry about. So wh- why would it have been worth the effort to actually keep your money in two or three different banking partners? Totally. Yeah. It's wild. I mean, I, I think keeping multi, I think he- every part of, you know, it, it, again, these single points of failure, they don't, they're, they don't matter until they matter. Yep. You know? Um, like I think about that with growth assistant in the Philippines sometimes, like, I'm like, well, should we be in multiple countries? Like what happens if just some treaty breaks and all of a sudden, like we can't employ those people. Like that's yeah. a real single point of failure. And I think as you get bigger, they don't matter in the early days, but as you get bigger, you got to like get building rid- redundancies in actually yeah. is like a really important thing to think about. Any, uh, any final thoughts on the situation, which obviously if there's any new information that comes out, we'll talk about it on, uh, on an upcoming episode, but any final thoughts before we uh, finish up with a question from one of our listeners? No, I mean, I think, I think like the, uh, I said it to Nick today. I was like, man, I'm so glad he was on top of this. Like, I'm not, I mean, I I probably would have heard the news. I do think there's something to be said about, again, the sad part about them failing, but there are plenty of companies who did get their money out before this happened. Now they might've caused it to happen, but like, I don't know which side you go on. Right. But it is important to be on top of these things it is important to kind of like, I, I am one of these founders uh, who believe the founder has to, it doesn't matter how big the company is, has to ultimately own the balance sheet and own that cash number. And and nobody else can ever fully, truly own that. So I think the only other thing I would say, one of my lessons has always been, I got to know where the money is. I got to know where it's going. I still do with every business a two, I don't know if you ever did this. Do you do a check run? Do you know what check run is? No. It's like this old school thing. You're going to laugh when you hear this. So like, you know, back in the day, every two weeks, the boss, like someone would bring in the checks and the payroll and the boss would go check. I'm going to sign all these checks. I'm going to know where all the money's going out. And it's something somebody said to me early on that like, you have to take that responsibility. And a, a year past being the CEO of Ampush, I did it at Ampush. I do it with every single Gateway X company, which it's obviously not checks anymore, but every two weeks before any money goes out, someone has to sit with me for 15 minutes and go, Here's payroll this week, you know, these for these two weeks. Here's who it's going to. Here's Smart. the reimbursement we're paying. And I've just always done that. And it's just like a simple thing. It's like I, I have to see everything going out and and ultimately and by the way, I find all kinds of funny, interesting things in that process. I mean, it, it's honestly, you know, someone could argue it's 15 minutes wasted. Someone else could say it's like it's a force function for you just understanding your business better than anyone yeah. else. And I could tell you the cash balance of every business right now off the top of my head because I do that every two because it's just a cash bridge, right? Between the, yeah. so I always know what the cash no, is. No, I, I think that's so smart. Some things just leave you guessing. Like 
why are yawns contagious? But you know who doesn't leave you guessing? MailChimp. MailChimp analyzes data points from billions of emails to offer up personalized recommendations to help you improve areas like email content and audience targeting. Get started today at MailChimp.com slash guesswork. That's MailChimp.com slash guesswork. Okay, well, on this really positive light note uh, that we've been talking about for the last 31 minutes, let's uh, let's finish up with a startup AMA. So we have a question from uh, Reggie, who's a listener in SF. And Reggie asked, and it, it was a question that actually came in in the last 24 hours. The question was about comms. Like, when bad news happens within your company, whether it's you're laying people off, whether it's a cyber attack, whatever it is, something that is not positive within your business, what are your strategies for communicating to your company in a way that is both honest, but <laughs> but isn't you saying, don't worry, you have nothing to fear? Don't panic. Don't panic. Um... It, like the answer is obviously it depends. Uh, it depends on the nature of this. You know, is it a sexual harassment issue? Did you did you lose a lot of money to Silicon Valley Bank? Did your biggest client leave? I mean, I've probably been in all three of those. I've had to communicate versions <laughs> at different times. Yeah. Um, so there's the, a lot of the answer is it depends. I think like it, the the more you put yourself in someone else's shoes for any kind of communication, the better. So like empathy, what are, what's that they're thinking? One of my frameworks I like is the I, the we, the it. Have you ever heard that one? No. Like, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for my team? And what does it mean for the company? Like the group, like the whole thing. And so like being able to very clearly disp- dispel what that means. Um, I think like the other big one for me is like being honest about the current state of it. And then like, what are the next steps and when can they hear again? It's just like, you know, any kind of trust building situation, which is just like, okay, here's where it stands. Here's what we're doing to figure it out. Cause a lot of the times you're just communicating without, you don't, even today I was like, I said it luckily, right. And I was like, I'm communicating what I know right now. I don't think, you know, like, totally. but I will let you know again today where we stand. And then, and then nobody, I don't know, there's only, the team's very small, but like nobody was mad that I said your pay, you know, payroll may be delayed. So I think being honest about what you know, where you stand, what what facts you you are aware of, what things you don't know, right? Like if you're very, I don't know this, I don't know this, I don't know this, and here's what I'm going to do next, uh, and here's when you can hear from, expect to hear from me again. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it sounds like basic stuff, but at the end of the day, it's like this basic stuff that that leaders and founders mess up all the time. It's like uh, over communicating. It's putting yourself in the shoes of the people that you're speaking with. And at the end of the day, it's building trust. How can people trust you? Because moments like that, any moment, whether you talk about um, a riff, whether you talk about some uh, article that came out about your company, right? It, it's a, it's potentially a, a a chink in the armor of trust that people have in you, right? So it's like, how do you reestablish that? You know, I think one of the biggest things that comes to mind for me, and it, it goes back to empathy, but it's the rule of thumb is write down every question that you could envision your company asking you about what has happened and to the best of your ability, obviously not breaching confidentiality that ha- that happens with right. individuals within the company. How do you answer all of those questions proactively before people ask them? Because I think what that does is it leaves less up for interpretation because we as people are story making machines and people will create stories if they don't have answers. And the second is I think it it actually helps build trust when someone says, oh, wow, Jesse, Alex, whoever may be, they've thought about all of this and they, they have done their best within their ability with the information they have to give us the information they have. And I think to your point, the other thing you said is if you set an expectation of I'm going to over communicate, I'm going to speak always about what the current situation is based on the knowledge I know. But that could change in the future because new information is going to come in, but you're going to always know what the current information is. And I'm always going to have some plan based on that information of how we are going to push things forward. I think that's all you can ask for from a leader. Yeah. The only thing I would add that it's like, it's something I learned, you know, type sevens, one of our traits, you don't even, I don't know how much you know about yourself. I'll teach you about yourself. Like we don't Tell like me. negative. We don't like we generally we like positive and happy and like we we sort of avoid the negative the things that ah, yep. i don't want to deal with that right 
And I think for me, the way that used to show up was like in a tough situation, I would not sort of fully allow the bad to be there. I'd go, oh yeah, yeah, but we'll, you know, I'd spin basically. I wouldn't even mean to be spinning in a like manipulative way. Like my, my, I would just naturally avoid it. And then I wouldn't talk through it or think about it. And actually this is obviously a slightly different situation, but we had a big session this week. The whole Kahani team came in town and we did a big thing on product market fit. You know, are we 10 out of 10? Are we five out of 10? And the numbers were kind of low. And then we did this really cool exercise, which I'll tell you about sometime where you're like, how did we all create this? How do we make and-, and by the way, just before you say it, we we did an episode on like where you're at on yeah. the out of 10 scale for Connie. So if you haven't listened to the episode yet, go back in in the feed and uh Justin and I talked about where Connie is from a product market fit perspective and and how he gets there. Sorry, and keep we going. went through the intellectual part of it, and everyone's like, Yeah, there's this issue, and we haven't got customers here. And then I like I paused for a second and like I wouldn't have done this five, seven years ago. I looked around, I'm like how do you guys feel about that? You know, like, how do we feel like that? This feels frustrating. I feel really frustrated that we haven't found it yet. And like, you could just see people's bodies releasing. Yeah, this sucks. I wish, you know, but then somebody, somebody, everyone kind of did that a little bit. Then everyone's like, yeah, but this is, this is what it's all about. Like, and all of a sudden it was a very authentic rally, if that makes sense versus a, a contrived rally. Like yeah. we actually released and felt our feelings. So I think the other thing you can do when you're delivering bad news to answer Reggie's question is like make room to, to not just empathy of what it means for you or something, but also empathy about how it must feel or how you're feeling. Like if I were, if I were a CEO and I have $10 million for this SVB thing stuck in a bank account and I'm burning cash right now, I would be guys, I'm feeling a little scared right now. Like I don't, you know, I'm going to be like, I wouldn't surprise me if you're feeling scared also. Like, I think being that honest around your emotions and creating that space will build a ton of trust with everybody. Yeah. I, I think that's such a good point to leave to leave off on. And I would say, yeah, I'm the same way. I think it's so easy to fall into this bucket of what could be considered by some as blind optimism because we like to convince ourselves that everything will always be okay. But I think inherently it's like this protective mechanism for not displaying weakness and for creating this alternate reality that actually sometimes does it does a disservice to you making changes or doing things that put you back on the right track. So I think that's spot on. Um, this has been awesome. And honestly, I feel like, like, you know, so much about the intricacies of just like financial services and how the banking system works. And so I feel like I got a masterclass from this. Again, this is a really shitty situation for everyone that is like on the front lines dealing with the SVB situation. Like they've been such um, an important part of the ecosystem for so long. So, uh, you know, I, I know I speak for both of us where uh, I I think we b- both can say that we hope this uh, finds a resolution. We hope that this finds a buyer that the companies that are really scared right now do find a resolution soon. And um, any founders that are trying to navigate this situation or, you know, just uh, want, want someone to chat to. I know Jesse and I are always looking to uh, just spend time with founders and and provide perspective where it's helpful. So uh, Jesse, yeah. anything else before next episode? No, I, I hope this episode, for those who are wondering, I think there's a lot. I, I did a poll yesterday. I was like, and more than two thirds of my followers had no clue what was actually going on. So I think that's when I, I was like, let's do an emergency. Like we need to explain. I also think people. it was higher, by the way. I think it was higher. I think some people are saying they know. I of think course. It's probably yeah, 80%. yeah, yeah. And I'm sure I don't even, you know, neither of us fully gra- grasp it either. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But, but I think hopefully this was also is timely for everyone who's wondering and listening and, and uh, the crazy ones out there can get some, you know, educated around it. Totally. Love it. Cool, man. Well, uh, this was a really good conversation. Uh, We are super excited to catch you all next episode. And as always, send us a message saying hi. Ask us any questions you have at thecrazyones at morningbrew.com. And we'll catch you all next episode. Take it easy, everyone. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of The Crazy Ones. If you're an entrepreneur or a builder and want more great startup content, make sure to subscribe on our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts.